Okay, in this video, we're going to talk about uh, section 2.2, .2, dealing with limits, infinite limits, and limits at infinity. So we'll continue our discussion on limits here. In this video, we're going to find limits of rational functions and find limits of functions at infinity and find horizontal and vertical asymptotes, okay? So first we'll talk about infinite limits. All right, now there are various possibil possibilities under which the limit as x approaches some constant a of the function f of x does not exist. For example, if one-sided limits are different at x is equal to a, then the limit does not exist. Another situation where a limit may fail to exist involves functions whose values become very large as x approaches a. Now here we're going to be using a special symbol called the infinity symbol. It looks like the number 8 lying on its side. So that's a symbol called infinity. We use that to describe this type of <clears throat> this type of behavior, excuse me. To illustrate this case, consider the function f of x is equal to 1 divided by x minus 1, which is discontinuous at x is equal to 1. As x approaches 1 from the right, the values of f of x are positive and become larger and larger. In other words, the function increases without bound. And we can write that symbolically as this. f of x is equal to 1 divided by x approaches infinity as x approaches 1 from the right. Now, since infinity is not a real number, the limit above does not actually exist. We say that because if you define a limit by definition of a limit, uh, usually it has to be getting closer and closer to a finite number. Okay? And infinity is not a real number. So the limit above would not actually exist. Here we're using the symbol infinity to describe the manner in which the limit fails to exist. And we call this infinite limit. So as x approaches 1 from the left, the values of f are negative and become larger and larger in absolute value. That is f of x will decrease through the negative values without bound. And we can write that symbolically as this. <clears throat> f of x is equal to 1 divided by x minus 1 approaches negative infinity as x approaches 1 from the left. And we can see that on this graph here. So in this case here, you can see that it's approaching infinity, positive infinity, as we let x approach 1 from the right side of 1. Because here, in this case here, this is where 1 is on the graph. And as we come get closer and closer to 1 from the right, this part goes to infinity, positive infinity. And as we go from the left, as we let x get closer and closer to 1 from the left side of 1, you can see that this graph is going downward to negative infinity. So we can say that the limit as x approaches 1 of 1 over x minus 1 does not exist. To the right is going to positive infinity, and to the left is going to negative infinity. Okay? And if you recall, the limits on the left side and on the right side, they have to be the same. All right, let's look at this example here. Let's say I want to find the limits in parts A, B, and C below for this function, f of x equal to 6 divided by x minus 4, and we're going to use negative infinity and positive infinity when appropriate. So in part A, we want to find the limit as x approaches 4 from the left. All right, let's do this graphically in our calculator. So let me clear this out. I'm going to go to y equal 2. I'm going to clear this equation out as well. 
and type in 6x, which is my numerator. So 6 and then x t theta n for the x. That will be divided by, the denominator will be in parentheses. So be left parentheses. For the x, we press x t theta n for your x minus 4, close parentheses. And I'm going to do zoom 6. For the standard window, you're going to see what that graph looks like. Let me check something here. Or I can do this zoom bit to fit, get all this on here. Try something else here, zoom fit. Yeah. There we go. Now you can see what's happening here. Now we're going to use this to help us uh, answer part A, B, and C. In this case here, part A, we want the limit as X approaches four from the left. All right. Four is over here somewhere. As we come to the left of four, coming from the left of four, you're going to see that this graph is going downward to negative infinity. Okay. As we get closer and closer to four, from the left side of four, this graph of this function will be going downward to negative infinity. So in part A, that would be negative infinity. Now part B, we're finding the limit as X approaches four from the right. So here's four and to the right of four, you're going to see the graph of f of x is going upward to positive infinity, okay? It's not approaching a finite number, but it's just going to positive infinity, all right? And that's going to be answer choice A. Now we need to select the uh, correct choice below for part C and state what that limit is and or or whether the limit does not exist. Notice to the left of four is going to positive infinity and to the right of four, I mean negative infinity, but to the right of four is positive infinity. So here it's not going in the same direction, okay? They're not the same. So that means your limit does not exist. Because to the left of four, you're going to positive infinity. And to the right of four, you're going to, I mean, to the left of four is negative infinity. To the right of four is positive infinity. Okay. All right, now let's look at example two. Here we want to evaluate the following limits or state that they do not exist. We use negative infinity or positive infinity where appropriate. In part A, we got the limit as x approaches 3 from the right of, in this case, 5 divided by the quantity x minus 3 raised to the fourth power. All right, let's see what this will look like on the calculator. So go to y equal to Clear your previous equ equation out. The numerator is 5, so it'll be 5 divided by the denominator. We're going to put in parentheses, so left parentheses, x c theta n for the x minus 3, close parentheses, and then press your hat key for your exponent, and then 4. So here I'm going to do zoom, and I'll do zoom fit. Oops. Okay, let's try zoom six for the standard window. I'm not sure why it's not doing that. Okay, there we go. Now, as X approaches three from the right of three, so here's three to the right of three, 
this is going in the upward direction. It's not going to a finite number, but we can say that it's going off to infinity. So we'll choose this answer and just say that this is it going to infinity for the limit as x approaches 3 from the right. Now, how about as x approaches 3 from the left of that same function? Well, to the left of 3 will be coming from the left. You can see this is also shooting off to infinity as well. All right, and now part C, so limit as x approaches 3 of 5 divided by x minus 3, quantity raised to the fourth power. Notice the limit to the left is going to infinity, and the limit to the, well, the limit to the right goes to infinity, and the limit to the left goes to infinity as well. So they're both going to infinity, so we can say that the limit as x approaches 3 of 5 divided by the quantity x minus 3, 3 raised to the 4th goes to infinity. Okay. All right, now let's look at infinite limits and how they're related to vertical asymptotes. Now, the vertical asymptote, which is the line x equals a, for the graph of y equal f of x if f of x approaches infinity or f of x approaches negative infinity as x approaches a from the right or x approaches a from the left. That is, f of x incre either increases or decreases without bound as x approaches a from the left or from the right. Okay. Now, if any one of the four possibilities is satisfied, this makes x equals a, a vertical asymptote. Most of the time, the limit will be infinite, either positive or negative, on both sides, but it does not have to be, okay? Because we looked at a couple of graphs where the limit on the left side went to negative infinity and the limit on the right side went to positive infinity. And the other example that I just did where on the left and on the right, they both went to positive infinity. And if you remember from college algebra, that's just going to be that vertical dotted line going through the x-axis at that particular x value. And normally, or usually, your vertical asymptote is where you set your denominator equal to zero after you divide out your common factors first. <clears throat> So here's how we locate vertical asymptotes. If a function f is continuous at x is equal to a, then the limit as x, uh, x approaches a of f of x equals the limit as x approaches a from the right of f of x and also equal to the limit as x approaches a from the left of f of x, equaling to f of a. Now, since all the above limits exist and are finite, f cannot have a vertical asymptote at x is equal to a. In order for the function f to have a vertical asymptote at x equals a, at least one of the limits above must be an infinite limit, and f must be discontinuous at x is equal to a. Now, we know that polynomial functions are continuous for all real numbers, so a polynomial will never have vertical asymptotes. Now, since a rational function, that's where the variable, where you have in the numerator and the denominator polynomial functions, rational functions are discontinuous only if, only at the zeros of its denominator. A vertical asymptote of a rational function can occur only at a zero of its denominator. So here the following is a simple procedure for locating the vertical asymptotes of a rational function. And here it is. If f of x is equal to n of x divided by d of x is a rational function, and d of c is equal to zero, and n of c is not equal to zero, that means the denominator 
at that x value is zero, the numerator of that x value or that value of c is not equal to zero, then the line x equals c will be your vertical asymptote of the graph of the function f. So now let's look at this example. Let's say I want to find the limits in A through C below for the function f of x equal to x squared minus 3x minus 28 divided by x minus 7. Here we use negative infinity or positive infinity when appropriate. So let's say I want to find the limit as x approaches 7 from the left of this function f of x. Okay. So here, if I take the limit as x approaches 7 from the left of f of x, and here f of x is that x squared minus 3x minus 28. Whole thing divided by x minus 7. Now, if you try to replace your x with 7 in the numerator and the denominator, you're going to get 0 over 0, which is, in this case, an indeterminate form. 0 over 0 is what we call the indeterminate form, if you recall in the last video for section 2.1. Okay? So we need to factor and divide out these common terms, in this case, if at all possible. So here the limit as x approaches 7 from the left, we're going to factor x squared minus 3x minus 28 into two binomials. x squared breaks up as x and x. Factors of negative 28 that will give me negative 3x would be, let's see, minus 7 and plus 4. And all that's over x minus 7. And in this case, your x minus 7 is in the numerator and the denominator divides out. So that means I'm going to have the limit as x approaches 7 from the left of x plus 4. And it looks like I can do direct substitution by substituting my x with 7. So it'll be 7 plus 4, which is 11. So the limit does exist. So the limit at the limit of that function when x approaches seven from the left hand side would be eleven. Now part B, which is right here, deals with as x approaches seven from the right. Okay. So I'll do this down here, the limit as x approaches 7 from the right of the x squared minus 3x minus 28. All that's divided by x minus 7. Now, we already simplified that, so we'll do the limit as x approaches 7 from the right. This simplifies as, of course, x minus, I mean, x plus 4. Because we did that for part A, as you can see. And then replace the x with 7, do direct substitution as 7 plus 4, which is 11. So from the right of 7, that limit of f of x will be also 11. Notice from the left of 7, we got 11. And from the right of 7, we got 11. So they're both the same. So in part c, the limit as x approaches 7 of f of x will end up being 11. Okay. All right, here's example 4. Using negative infinity or infinity where appropriate to describe the behavior at each zero of the denominator and identify all vertical asymptotes. See, we got f of x is equal to 1 over x plus 5. f of x equals to 1 divided by x plus 5. Well, let's take our denominator of x plus 5. 
set that equal to zero. So in this case here, we can just solve for x and that would give us what our vertical asymptote is gonna be. So if I subtract five, that would mean x is equal to negative five. So x equals negative five is, <coughs> excuse me, is the equation of the vertical asymptote. So here we're gonna locate all the zeros here. That means this function has a zero of the denominator at x equals negative five. So it'll be this answer choice here. All right, now, here's some other questions that they're asking here. Describe the behavior of f of x at x as x approaches the zero of the denominator from the left. And select your uh, answer choice as indicated here. Well, let me do this in the calculator first. So if I do y equal to, let's see, clear this equation out. The numerator is one, so it'll be one divided by the denominator. I'm gonna put the x plus five in parentheses. So left parentheses, x e theta n for the x plus five, close parentheses. So if I do zoom six, okay. And as you can see here, my vertical asymptote will be at x is equal to negative five. So it does say here as x approaches the zeros of the denominator from the left, f of x approaches to either positive or negative infinity. Well, here's five right here. To the left of five, you're gonna see it's going downward to negative infinity. So in this case, as x approaches the zero of that denominator from the left is shooting off to negative infinity. Okay. Now, what about as X approaches the zero of the denominator from the right? Well, to the right of five, uh, to the right of negative five, you can see it's going up to positive infinity. Okay. Now here we're going to identify all the vertical asymptotes here. All right. So in this case here, even though we know the limit does not exist, so at x is equal to five, it's got to be the uh, vertical asymptote. So the vertical asymptote would be the equation x is equal to negative five. Okay. All right, on the next page is finding limits at infinity. Limits at infinity. So here the infinity symbol is a symbol used to describe the behavior of limits that do not exist. The symbol, which is your infinity symbol, can also be used to indicate that an independent variable is increasing or decreasing without bound. So we will write x approaches infinity to indicate that x is increasing through positive values without bound and x approaching negative infinity to indicate that x is decreasing without bound through negative values. So here we begin our consideration of limits at infinity by considering powers, power functions of the form x is equal to p and one over x to the p. I should say x to the power of p and one over x to the power of p, where p is a positive real number. If p is a positive real number, then x to the p increases as x increases. And it can be shown that there is no upper bound on the values of x to the p. Okay. 
and we begin our consideration of limits at infinity by considering power functions of the form x to the p and 1 over x to the p, where p is a positive real number. And if p is a positive real number, then x to the p increases as x increases. And I think I have pretty much wrote the same thing down, so I might need to omit that because that's just a repeat of this. But here we can indicate that by writing it like this, x to the p approaches infinity as x approaches infinity, or we can say the limit as x approaches infinity of x to the power of p is infinity. Okay. Now, since the reciprocals of very large numbers are very small numbers, it follows that 1 over x to the p approaches 0 as x increases without bound. So now we can indicate this behavior by writing this. 1 over x to the p approaches 0 as x approaches infinity, or we can say the limit as x approaches infinity of 1 to the power of p is equal to zero. That means as we let x get bigger and bigger and bigger, then one over x to the power of p is closer and closer to zero. Example of that, and I can go ahead and pull up this graph right here of f of x is equal to one divided by x plus five. Pretty much as you can see, as we let x get bigger and bigger and bigger, it gets closer and closer to zero. As we let the limit as x approaches infinity. All right, now theorem two deals with the limits of power functions at infinity. So if p is a positive real number and k is any real number except zero, then the limit as x approaches uh, negative infinity of k over x to the power of p will be zero. Same holds true for positive infinity if we let the limit as x approach positive infinity of k over x to the p, that's also going to be zero. Now, these two deal with polynomial functions here. The limit as x approaches negative infinity of k times x to the p could be infinity or negative infinity. Same holds true as we let the limit as x approaches positive infinity of k x to the p. It could be infinity or negative infinity, provided that x to the p is a real number for negative numbers of x. The limits in 3 and 4 would either be negative infinity or positive infinity, and it depends upon the constant k and your exponent p. Right, so the last limit is only defined if the p power of a negative number is defined. This means p has to be an integer or a rational number with an odd denominator. Now, what about the limits at infinity for polynomial functions? Let's look at the, that one. So as x increases without bound in either the positive or the negative direction, the behavior of the polynomial graph will be determined by the behavior of the leading term. That is going to be the highest degree term. Now, if you remember leading coefficient, leading term, of course, you look for the highest exponent in that polynomial function, Leading coefficient would be the coefficient of the variable to the highest power. The leading term will either become very large in the positive sense or in the negative sense, assuming that the polynomial has degree of at least one. In the first case, the function will approach infinity, and in the second case, the function will approach negative infinity. In mathematical shorthand, we write this as the limit as x approaches infinity of f of x equaling to plus or minus infinity. So here, this will cover all the possibilities. 
All right, so now let's look at theorem three, dealing with limits of polynomial functions at infinity. So if this polynomial function P of X written like this, where N is greater than or equal to one for integer values N, then the limit as X approaches infinity of P of X equals the limit as X approaches infinity of a sub n x to the n that's going to be equal to either positive infinity or negative infinity. And the same holds true if it was the limit as x approaches negative infinity of your polynomial function. That will be equal to the limit as x approaches negative infinity of a sub n x to the n. It's going to be equal to either positive infinity or negative infinity. Each limit will be either negative infinity or positive infinity, depending upon a sub n and n. Now, a polynomial of degree zero is a constant function, p of x equaling to a sub zero, and its limit as x approaches infinity or negative infinity will be that number a sub zero. Polynomial functions of degree one or greater never have horizontal asymptotes. So here's an example of that. Let's say I want to find the limit of the polynomial function P of X, and this is two parts, as X approaches infinity and as X approaches negative infinity. So we'll start we got this function p of x equaling to 3x cubed minus 5x squared plus 1. So we'll start by finding the limit as x approaches infinity of p of x, which means I'm at the limit as x approaches infinity of 3x cubed minus 5x plus 1. Now, what we need to do here is look at the leading term. Our leading term in this case is 3x cubed. And find out what's happening here. As x approaches infinity, x cubed, that's just going to go off to infinity. And three times infinity will end up being infinity. Now, in part B, we have the limit as x approaches negative infinity. The limit as x approaches negative infinity of P of x. So, our limit as x approaches negative infinity of that same term, 3x minus 5, 3x cubed minus 5x plus 1. So again, we look at our leading term, 3x cubed. So as x approaches infinity, negative infinity, anything negative and you cube it is going to be negative. And a negative times the three, well, of course, that's going to end up being negative infinity. Because keep in mind, a negative to a non power will be negative. Okay. Now we're going to find vertical. Well, actually, we're going to find horizontal asymptotes. The line y equals b is a horizontal asymptote for the graph of y equal f of x if f of x approaches b as either x increases without bound or decreases without bound. Symbolically, y equal b is a horizontal asymptote if we take the limit as x approaches infinity or negative infinity, I should say, of f of x is equal to b, or the limit as x approaches infinity of f of x will be equal to b.
Now, in the first case, the graph of F would be close to the horizontal line, Y equal B for large. And that's in absolute value, negative X. In the second case, the graph would be close to the horizontal line, Y equal B for large, positive X. And note that it is enough for if one of these conditions is satisfied, but frequently they both are. Okay. Now, theorem four deals with the limits of rational functions at infinity and the horizontal asymptote of rational functions here. This should be familiar to you because if you're taking college algebra, we did talk about how to uh, locate uh, horizontal asymptotes. So if this rational function where you have a quotient of polynomial functions, where a sub m and b sub m are not b sub n are not equal to zero, then if you take the limit as x approaches either plus or minus infinity of that function, it will be the leading term. a sub m x to the m divided by b sub n x to the n. And there are three possible cases for these limits. Sometimes it does help to look at your Excuse me. Sometimes it helps to look at your uh, degree of the polynomial function in the numerator and the denominator. That's the highest exponent. So if m is less than n, that means that the highest exponent in the numerator is less than the highest exponent in the denominator, then that means the limit as x approaches either plus or minus infinity of that function is equal to zero. That means that the line y equals zero or the x-axis, is the horizontal asymptote for the function f of x. Now, the second case is m is equal to n. That means that the highest exponent in the numerator equals the highest exponent in the denominator. Then the limit as x approaches plus or minus infinity of that function would be a sub m divided by b sub n. That's the leading coefficients in the numerator and the denominator. And that line represents your horizontal asymptote. And then the third case of M is greater than N. That, it, that means that the highest exponent in the numerator is more than or greater than the highest exponent in your denominator. Then the function itself will not have a horizontal asymptote. Okay. So... Let's look at this example right here. Find each function value and limit. Use negative infinity or positive infinity when, whenever appropriate. So in part A, we got, well, the functions f of x equals a 2x plus 7 divided by 7x minus 9. We're going to find out the value of that function when x is equal to 10. Now, for f of 10 at 10, we're not going to get a zero in the denominator. So we can just use direct substitution. So that means f of 10 would be equal to 2 times x, which is 10, plus 7. All divided by 7 times x, which is 10, minus 9. Let's see, 2 times 10 would be 20, plus 7 over 7 times 10, that's 70 minus 9. 20 plus 7 is 27. 70 minus 9 will be 61. And I don't think you're going to be able to reduce that. So 27 over 61 is the value of this rational function when x is equal to 10. Now, part B, f of 100. Well, again, I'm not going to get a zero in the denominator, so I'll just go ahead and substitute each x with 100. So f of 100 will be 2 times 100 plus 7 divided by 7 times x, which is 100, minus 9. Let's see. 
Two times a hundred. Two times a hundred is two hundred plus seven. Over seven times a hundred, that's seven hundred minus nine. 200 plus 7 is 207. 700 minus 9 would be 691. And I don't think you're going to be able to reduce that in simplest form. Let me see if I can. 207 divided by 691. Math key fraction. No. So it will be 207 over 691. And part C is found in the limit as x approaches infinity of the function f of x. And f of x in this case is 2x plus 7. 2x plus 7 divided by 7x minus 9. Now let's take a look at the highest exponent in the numerator, which is going to be m. And the highest exponent in the denominator, which is n. The highest exponent in the numerator, of course, that's like 2x to the 1. So your m is going to be 1. The denominator, the highest exponent there is also 1. And notice m and n are equal to each other. So that means I can take the limit as x approaches infinity of uh, the leading terms in the numerator and the denominator. And by the way, if you simplify the 2x divided by 7x, you're going to get the limit as x approaches infinity of just two sevens because the x's divide out. And if you recall, the limit of a constant is a constant. So it'd be two sevens. So the equation, y is equal to two sevens, would be your horizontal, I mean, your vertical asymptote. If you were, well, horizontal asymptote, I'm sorry. If you were asked to find out what your horizontal asymptote is, it'll be the equation y equal two sevens. All right, let's try this example here. Let's say I want to evaluate the indicated limit. So here we got the limit as x approaches infinity of 7x to the 6 minus 2x to the 4 divided by 4x to the 7 plus 3. So what we need to do here is uh, look at our n, which is the highest exponent in the numerator, and m, that's the highest exponent in the denominator. All right. Oh, I should say, let me, let me turn it the other way around. This will be m, and this will be n, just to be consistent. Okay, so your m is the highest exponent in the numerator, n is the highest exponent in the denominator. If you look at the numerator, the highest exponent there is 6. And if you look at your denominator, your highest exponent there is 7. So if you compare m and n, you're going to see that m is less than n. And when m is less than n, you're automatically told what the limit is going to be. So the limit as x approaches infinity, in this case, would be zero. So that means our limit as x approaches infinity of 7x to the 6 minus 2x to the 4th divided by 4x to the 7th plus three is automatically going to be zero. 
So the equation y equals zero is the horizontal asymptote if they ask for it. But here the limp dash in for the limit here, and that's just automatically going to be zero based on that uh you know that condition that I gave you about uh, locating horizontal asymptotes. Notice that in cases one and two on the previous slide, well, in cases one and two, that the limit is the same if x approaches infinity or negative infinity. Thus, a rational function can have at most one horizontal asymptote. Notice that the numerator and denominator have the same degree in this example. So the horizontal asymptote is going to be the ratio of the leading coefficient of the numerator and the denominator. So here we have the equation y equal 3x squared minus 5x plus 9 divided by 2x squared plus 7. So here you can see that the highest exponent in the numerator is the same as the highest exponent in the, de in the denominator. So that means we look at these leading coefficients, 3 over 2 which equals 1.5. So the equation y equal 1.5 is the horizontal asymptote for this graph, as you can see in red. So here, a rational function can only have one horizontal asymptote. So let's say I want to find the horizontal and vertical asymptotes in this example. So here you got f of x equal to x squared plus 3x, I mean x squared plus 36 divided by x squared minus 36. So let's start by finding the horizontal asymptote. So now we look at the highest exponent in the numerator, that's m, and the highest exponent in the denominator, that's n. Highest ex exponent in the numerator is 2, so m is 2. The highest exponent in the denominator, that's also 2. So if you compare n, m and n, they're both equal to each other. So here the limit, as let's say x approaches infinity, of f of x would be just those uh, leading terms, x squared in the numerator and x squared in the denominator. But x squared divided by x squared will be 1. So the equation y is equal to 1 is your horizontal asymptote. Now for the vertical asymptotes, We just simply take our denominator and set that equal to zero. That's the best way to find the vertical asymptotes is just take your denominators, take your denominator, x squared minus 36, and set that equal to zero. Now keep in mind, we can't factor x squared plus 36 into two binomials and try to divide something out. So x squared minus 36 will be equal to zero. And x squared minus 36 can be written as a factor of two binomials here. x squared breaks up as x and x. 36 is a perfect square. That means 6 times 6 gives me 36. And since it's a difference of two perfect squares, one must be plus, the other one has to be minus. So I get x plus 6 times x minus 6 is equal to 0. And then we set each binomial factor to be equal to 0. So this means x plus 6 is equal to zero, x minus six is equal to zero. And then we solve each equation for x. So the, for the x plus six is equal to zero, that means x is equal to negative six. 
then for the x minus 6 is equal to 0, x will have to be equal to 6. So these are my two vertical asymptotes for the graph of this function f of x, x equal negative 6 and x equal positive 6. All right, here's another example. Say we got f of x is equal to x to the sixth divided by x to the fourth plus seven. Now I want to uh, find the horizontal and vertical asymptotes if there are any. So let's first find the horizontal asymptote. So we identify the m, which is the highest exponent in the numerator, that's 6. Your n is the highest exponent in the denominator, that will be 4. Now, compare m and n. You can see 6 is greater than 4, so that means m is greater than n. And since m is greater than n, that means that the graph of this function has no horizontal asymptote. No horizontal asymptote. Okay. And that's because the highest exponent in the numerator is greater than the highest exponent in the denominator. Now for the vertical asymptotes. All right, so here we take our denominator of x to the fourth plus seven, set that equal to zero. Now, if I try to subtract seven on both sides, that means x to the fourth will be equal to negative seven. And I know this, there is no value of x when raised to the fourth power would give me negative seven as an answer. Because that's nonsense. There's no value of x raised to the fourth power that would give me negative seven. So I can say that this graph has no vertical asymptotes. And you can verify it on your graphing calculator to determine to see to see where y doesn't have a vertical asymptote. So if I did this, like y equal to, the numerator was uh, x raised to the 6 will be x c theta n, the hat key, and then 6 divided by, and then left parentheses, x c theta n for your x hat key, and then 4, 4 for your exponent, and then plus 7. If I was to do a graph of that and see if I can get that graph. Yeah, you can see what that graph looks like. There's no vertical asymptotes there and no horizontal asymptotes as well. Okay, last example in this video. Again, we're going to find the horizontal and vertical asymptotes of this one, 5x squared. I mean, f of x equal to 4x plus 5 divided by 5x squared plus 2. So in this case here, let's see if we can find out if there is a horizontal asymptote. So here n, I mean m, is the highest exponent in the numerator, that's one. Your n is the highest exponent in the denominator, that would be two. Compare m with n. You can see one is less than two, that means m is less than n. So that means that the limit as x approaches infinity of f of x, that's going to be the limit as x approaches infinity of just our leading terms, 4x divided by 5x squared. Now, notice if I simplify this, I'm going to be left with this. I can pull the four-fifths out 
and do the limit as x approaches infinity of one of the x's will be gone, so I'll be ha I'll have one over x. But I know this: as x approaches infinity, this one over x will automatically go to zero. Limit as x approaches infinity of one over x will automatically go to zero. So four fifths times zero is zero. So your horizontal asymptote will be the equation y is equal to zero. Now for the vertical asymptotes. I'll take my denominator of 5x squared plus 2 and set that equal to 0. And if I subtract 2 on both sides, that means 5x squared is equal to negative 2. And if I divide both sides by 5, that would mean x squared is negative 2 fifths. Here we've got a problem here. There's no value of x where I squared will give me negative two fifths. Okay, so that means I have no vertical asymptotes. Because my x values has to be real numbers, not imaginary numbers here. Okay. So that's how we locate vertical asymptotes and identify our horizontal asymptotes, okay? So that does complete this video in section 2.2, .2, dealing with infinite limits and limits at infinity. Feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions about any of the material that's discussed in this video or the homework problems that are in my math lab.